from the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're Inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution for global growth for more than 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism right here, right now, at the NYSE and at ICE's 12 exchanges and seven clearinghouses around the world. Now here's your host, Josh King, Head of Communications at Intercontinental Exchange. On this show, we're taking you on a journey, a journey inside the truth machine. How would you like to live in a world that restores personal control over our data, assets, and identities, grants billions of excluded people access to the global economy, and shifts the balance of power to revive society's faith in itself. That's the promise of the blockchain, and the premise of a new book by Michael Casey and Paul Vigna called, you guessed it, The Truth Machine, The Blockchain and the Future of Everything. As you know, we've been at the Futures Industry Association's 43rd annual International Conference in Boca Raton, Florida, a week filled with presentations by industry leaders and, of course, big thinkers and futurists, with meetings around the periphery where deals are done that have the potential to shape the economy to come. Michael Casey, co-author of The Truth Machine, is one of those big thinkers and futurists, a former journalist who spent 18 years with the Wall Street Journal covering global economics and finance. He's written five books and is now a special advisor at the MIT Media Lab, where he works on applications of the decentralizing technology behind Bitcoin and other digital currencies. With so many players in the futures industry and so many of us around the world watching in wonder at the rapid emergence of cryptocurrencies and its underlying blockchain technology, Jeff Sprecher, the chairman and CEO of Intercontinental Exchange, thought that Casey would stimulate a provocative dialogue on you guessed it, the future of everything. So we brought him in as the featured guest at our annual energy breakfast at FIA Boca. After the break, Jeff's conversation with Michael Casey. Crude oil is one of the most widely used and actively traded commodities in the world. Ice Brent Futures was developed as a waterborne contract in 1988 to protect against price movements of crude oil produced in the growing Norwegian and UK North Sea. The contract quickly grew to become the global price benchmark for crude oil. Today, the Brent complex includes a family of more than 400 related Brent-based hedging instruments, including the benchmark for diesel fuel, ICE gas oil. Visit theice.com slash global dash cruise for more information. So quickly to set the scene for you, this will be our first (laughs) event broadcast of the Ice House. And we're thrilled that our chairman and CEO, Jeff Sprecher, does the honors as our interlocutor with Michael Casey. As many listeners know, Jeff's no stranger to the disruptive power of innovation. Having bought the Continental Power Exchange for a dollar back in 1997 and turning it into ICE, now a Fortune 500 company that operates the exchanges, clearinghouses, and information services that market participants everywhere rely on to invest, trade, and manage risk across global financial and commodity markets. Now let's join the action in the grand ballroom of the Boca Raton Resort and Club. The first voice we'll hear is that of Jeff Sprecher. So welcome to Boca. Um, And uh, uh, a lot of us in this room have been struggling to learn about the industry that you know a lot about over the last few years. So uh, hopefully you can raise our knowledge level. Um, Once you start down the rabbit hole, though, it, it, you can get lost. <laughs> yeah, so just that. be warned, you know, you might want to shut your ears. This may be the thing that, that <laughs> contradicts Jane Gladstone, which is I may leave. <laughs> um, so um, just, you know, can you help us just explain for, for people that may not be as versed uh, in this, what is the blockchain? So a blockchain, I think we just have to get right back to the core of this function of record keeping, which is an essence of civilization. Right. Um, so I, the book is a little philosophical like that. We dive deeply into the history um, of record keeping and why it's important. And traditionally, we've had ledgers to keep track of transactions, uh, which is a very important function for the sake of imbuing trust 
uh, in our economic exchanges and therefore facilitating the capacity of human beings to enter into exchanges. So that's the big philosophical take on this. Traditionally, those ledgers have been run by centralized institutions. This is a decentralized process. And the reason why we call it a truth machine is because we're not trying to say that it's a, um, you know, a, a means of discovering absolute truth. You are not going to dis unpack the mysteries of the universe by reading <laughs> right. this book. Uh, and in fact, there's nothing to stop from, from inserting falsehoods into a, a blockchain. What it is is this kind of consensus idea of truth so that we now have a mechanism, and it's built upon some crazy math, cryptography, uh, a series of uh, uh, game theoretic constructions and things, so that there's a protocol that allows a, a, a completely decentralized, and it can vary the, the degree of decentralization, but ultimately uh, a dis distributed array of, of computers to arrive at this consensus uh, on the veracity of each update to the ledger, right? So, you, right. so as a result, you've now got uh, basically a system that can't be changed, not without you know, a lot of work going into that. Um, and you, you have kind of this real-time traceability because once everybody accepts that this is the common truth and you're accepting it at a given moment, you can trace this right back. So you have traceability, you have uh, immutability, uh, and, and you have this kind of like permanence to the record uh, and, and, a, and a distributed structure to it so that everybody is collectively participating in the upkeep of the ledger rather than there being these siloed, separate, centralized ledgers. Gotcha. So um, you've now, you were a reporter and you've now sort of found your way to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, what's going on? What are you doing there? What's going on at MIT that brought so, you there? You know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to develop the infrastructure. Um, there's Bitcoin itself, the oldest uh, blockchain, just does seven transactions a second, which to you guys, of course, is laughable. Right. Um, and, and therefore, th th there's, there's this big challenge as to how you scale it. And it looks a lot like, not entirely, but something like the early days of the internet when you know, th there, there was all these challenges that need to be resolved before this technology could be you know, basically mainstreamed. So we see our role, at least one important role, in, in sort of working hard on the protocol. Uh, so we have, for example, a guy called Taj Dreiger, who was the um, co-author of a very important white paper about something called the Lightning Network. Right. And, and this is a, 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 a payment channel system that you know, basically resides above Bitcoin, or above, in fact, for that matter, any cryptocurrency layer and then removes the kind of heavy computational requirement of there being a transaction being proven to this big complicated ledger every single time, but still gives provability. So we see this as second layer solutions. The internet was built uh, in layers. You know, you have TCP IP as the base protocol, um, and then you have all these other protocols, HTTP, SMTP, which give this functionality, and then you get applications on top of it. We think that something similar is going to happen with this technology as well. So Lightning is a second layer solution to try to lift up some of that stuff, get an, upon which we think applications will develop. So a lot of infrastructure development. We also have a guy from, that should interest you a lot of you, um, Rob Leali was uh, formerly heading up the digital currency uh, project at the Bank of England and is now working at MIT mm -hmm. with central banks to develop a <clears throat> prototype for a digital fiat currency. Gotcha. Um, so that's, that's the kind of like heavy you know, financial sector development that we're doing. Um, I myself am more interested in application layer solutions mm -hmm. and so I'm, when, you, when I saw it, it was the ICE energy breakfast, I know that ICE's uh, beginnings were in energy. Um, it, it's relevant. I'm into um, solar microgrids as, as, a, as a potential right. project. I'm interested in how we could capture value in that and potentially create securities on top of it. So this is a much more of an application. How do I, you know, it's, it's focused on social impact. We're looking to roll out these, these grids in, in, in Puerto Rico, actually. Um, and, and so, yeah, there's various layers of, of application that we're working on. But the other thing I would just say, this is a roundabout way of talking about all of this, but um, we think it's very important that in um, an environment that is open source, uh, has a sort of a wild anything goes feel to it, that is a kind of a voice of reason that is most importantly neutral. And the beauty of MIT, or 
for any matter that, that university, but one that, that carries the gravitas of MIT, is that people can look to it as, a, as an important, independent um, voice. And so we see ourselves something as not exactly a standards body, but potentially being important and, and you know, a player in the development of standards right. uh, because we're seen as an honest broker. I think um, certainly myself and a lot of people in this room a few years ago when we started to hear about blockchain started thinking about it and working on it. And I recently read a paper that had tracked over 80,000 proofs of concept, um, many of which were funded by people in this room and people that we know. Um, but of those 80,000, 92% had already been abandoned. And of the 8% that were still there, you have to assume some of those were recent and will be abandoned. So the failure rate that we're seeing um, is huge. But yet the enthusiasm or the rhetoric or the, the conversation that we're having about blockchain is, is almost fevered. How, how, do, how do you... What do you see going on there that, that, that makes something that fails so often so mm -hmm. popular? So I see all of this, including what to me is clearly a bubble in, in, in token prices, in, in a historical context. And, and, and the historical context that is um, uh, not constant, where there is ever-increasing uh, exchange of ideas in an open source you know, rapid fire environment. I mean, it, it, we, whenever there is a new idea that comes along uh, that could be potentially transformative, and I'm sure, you know, when we go back and look at all these bubbles through history, and so I'm talking, using bubble here broadly because it's the bubble of, of investment, but it's also the bubble of, of kind of R&D. You know, exploring, throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing, seeing what happens. I think you'll find this has always been the case. I mean, but, but the thing is, it's all a matter of degree, right? right? So obviously you wouldn't have had nearly those sorts of numbers looking at you know, early experiments in railroads or something. But it, relative to its time, you know, whenever these technologies come along, there is a massive amount of, of you know, attempts to be the big guy that runs away with it. I think, you know, and clearly I, I wouldn't have written this book if I didn't think that, that at the core there is this very huge potential to, uh, to transform not just our financial markets, but our economy generally. So you go through this process, and it's a process that is inherently Wild West-like, right. because no one's in charge. Um, you know, and it, it looks like the dot-com bubble in many right. respects, right? But I think you know, the dot-com bubble was, was done in 1990s context, right? right. But without AI and big data and all the massive amount of... of existing new infrastructure that we have with it, within which to roll out these experiments. Remember, there's so much code out there now that can be tapped that it's really easy to do this. Open source codes actually really in facilitate an enormous amount of R&D that right. wasn't ever possible before. It's cheap to roll out those POCs. I do think that um, there's a great deal of hype, and that feeds it, right. and, and, and the numbers that you cite reflect that. But I do think that that also is, is a, a, a kind of a necessary or an inevitable uh, reflection of this moment. So I don't find those numbers surprising at all, to be okay. honest. Yeah. And you think of the, you know, that, that something comes out of the other end, um, that, that all of that failure uh, will produce, uh, there'll be a phoenix, if you will, and that, something will... Yeah, will I, 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 really, I really do. A phoenix would be, would be nice, wouldn't it? Um, it's a good name for an ICO. <laughs> phoenix coin. Yes, high five, man. <laughs> we'll uh, be the richest men on the face yeah, of the earth. Could be, could be. <laughs> For a day. <laughs> For a day. <laughs> um, I've been grappling with, and I think I may have gotten it, and you guys can see whether this sticks with you or not, but um, I, with the dot-com bubble analogy. Um, and, and, and look, obviously, a lot of money was wasted. ZZ best. ZZZ best. I, I, I was... <laughs> For some reason, I, I didn't know that one. I certainly knew of Pets.com and others, but, but Chris has given me ZZZ Best now as my, as my go-to reference point. Um, <laughs> a lot of hyper-speculation, a lot of um, uh, money was lost. But we all now also know that, that underneath that was built the infrastructure upon which this interesting new you know, Isnet 2.0 era evolved with, you know, smart, with um, smartphones and... Uh, social media, cloud computing, and big data, and all these concepts were made possible because during that boom, cheap capital was unlocked 
uh, and went into things like fiber optic cable, uh, 3G mobile uh, research. A lot of data centers were built out. And then that gave us something to work upon. I think that it's, it's harder to put your finger on what's got, what, where those like, nodes are of, of infrastructural capacity. But there's something very similar happening in a social, what I call social infrastructure context. And again, open source code, this is a key part of this, right? There are so many lines of code being written right now by these social networks of collaborating uh, developers that might do nothing right now and look like a useless coin. Two years down the road, someone's going to come along and say, oh, if we just flip that and, and do something else, we could build this killer app, right? right. Bitcoin itself is a function of that. It was built upon, it, it, you know, it's just an amalgam of like five or six different uh, you know, technologies that have been around for quite a while. And he just put them all together and lo and behold created this remarkable invention. Um, he, she, it, they, we, I'm not saying I know who Satoshi Nakamoto is. Um, so I think something similar is, is underway. Um, and and it's, it's a really interesting and exciting time to be involved. It's why I... Uh, you know, I, I'm interested in this. Why well, I quit my job? I mean, the, the, to be part of this kind of swirling mass of human inventiveness, with all the risks that come with it as well, right, uh, is, is a really interesting thing to be engaged in. Well, I watched two events that I thought were fascinating um, in the blockchain recently. First, there was a kind of a well-publicized, I'll call it a fraud, where um, a lot of uh, uh, coins that were on the Ethereum network were stolen. And, and this caused great consternation, obviously, to, to the community around that. And ultimately, a decision was made to change the code so that it took the value of those stolen coins away. So basically, do some kind of a fork in the code and, and, and make those stolen coins, uh, let's call it useless. And then similarly, you know, you mentioned, I think you said the, that the blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain can do maybe seven transactions per second. And there's been a lot of talk by people who said, well, we should, we should create Bitcoin Cash or some other uh, derivative that would have more capacity. And those two events were a social conversation. They were not the truth machine. They were not indelible code that, uh, that, that solved the problem. They, were, they, were, they turned to human beings who said the record may be wrong or needs to be changed or the backbone needs to be changed in order to affect a different outcome. And, and when you look at who were the leaders that, so that, then it almost feels like leaders emerged with a strong voice. And who were the leaders? Well, they were some of the early code writers, most of whom are uh, very wealthy, uh, at least on paper today. Um, they were not elected by anybody. There was no sort of governance or construct around them, and they sort of used their brute force to affect a will on a, on a group of people, an unelected, wealthy group of people. Is that what Satoshi thinks is the governance of the blockchain? Um, look, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to you know, let the cat out of the bag. I, 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 yeah. Speaking speaking as Satoshi. Okay. Uh, <laughs> At least channel him. <laughs> uh, I've got no idea what Satoshi was in his head. I mean, we've read the white paper. I think people are always trying to sort of, you know, deign what... And this is actually an interesting way to, to emphasize your point, because I agree with, with your characterizations entirely of what happened. Um, the very fact that people struggle to figure out and they care who Satoshi Nakamoto is speaks to this innate desire amongst human beings to have a human being that they can point to as being the authority figure in this, right? Everyone's always appealing to Satoshi as what he would have done. Um, so I don't think we're capable of building a truth machine that is entirely separate from all this social infrastructure right. that is critical. In fact, it's a big theme of the book is that we've just got to deal with this. Like, so I, I find... Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a somewhat philosophical take on your question. I'll come back to some of the more specifics. But the, um, the, there's this word trustlessness, which I find really annoying, that emerges out of the crypto world, as if the only way we could possibly build these things is so that not a single trusted third party is ever involved. Because it's a very paranoid way to think. And this is natural, because crypto, cryptographers are sort of inherently paranoid <laughs> people. They, they think that, uh, you know, just because everyone's 
not out to get you, doesn't mean what's the, 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 the there's a conspiracy, a conspiracy to get theory, you. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the the they what by saying that they're ignoring the reality of what the world is, and and so I think that we have to do this. We have to have these trusted entities in some form. And part of this development process that I'm talking about that MIT is involved in as we go forward, 10, 20 years, how long this will take, is figuring out not just the core infrastructure from a cryptographic perspective, but also you know, what sort of social institutions are we going to build so that there is governance around the chain, so that minority interests are protected, which is essentially what the problem was with that Ethereum thing that you're alluding to, so that founders have got some constraints on them. And then working out what we can do with that, and you know, regulators have a, a key role, I think, to, to think about this, what the actual, um, not, not just how are we protecting customers and, uh, and investors, but also um, market structure. Right? H- how are we thinking about these chains as um, as a marketplace, and therefore, you know, are we are we creating oligopolies of gatekeepers here? Right. Uh, what is the optimal level of decentralization that that allows for the best input in all of this? And there's a lot of work to be done. So I think you can take a lot of lessons from the existing. I mean, you can go right back to the U.S. Constitution and think about balances of power and all these right. things. And how does that? How do we take that and map it into this space? But also intersect with these you know, existing institutions. I think both need to recognize each other and, and, and move forward. Um, so I'm by no means um, a hardcore. I think it would be an absolutely terrifying world to exist in if we were just reliant on an algorithm. I think that would be, we might as well just turn off the lights and shut down humanity. Yeah. Um, so, But aren't there people that, that are really the deep proponents of the blockchain, that that, that is actually what's driving them. That's part of the, the, the notion that this could be fully distributed global and not overseen by a central bank in, in terms of a currency or a government in terms of, of, of information. Disintermediating, and you're one of the big disintermediators yourself. So you know, you, you've been... Yeah, but I'm talking to you because I'm worried that you may be the next one that <laughs> does it to me. It's not me, by the way. I'm, I'm, I'm not driving this ship, you know. I'm not Satoshi, just to be clear here. Um, uh, look, I, th- I think that we see, it's all a spectrum to me, and, and we need to get to a more decentralized system. We are building a decentralized economy. We've got distributed energy systems coming out. We've got IoT. We have peer-to-peer lending. We have all of this infrastructure, which is you know, every day becoming more and more decentralized at the same time that we're building these huge honeypots of, de- of centralized data. It's a, it's a hacker's dream. Yeah. Right? You have, they can, they've got more and more access points that are as vulnerable as ever. Doorknobs on your house can be a way to get into JP Morgan's, not to pick on them, right. saying that this is the way it's going to happen, by the way. But you know, any big institution is vulnerable now by this decentralized, decentralized system. I think we need a decentralized trust architecture to, to kind of be commensurate with that system because if we don't, we're just going to have these contracts. And so that's the directionality. Uh, and it inherently involves disintermediating a lot of gatekeepers. But it doesn't mean that as a society we shouldn't have these social, external, off-chain sources of trust right. that bring us back whenever things go wrong. So I'm certainly not advocating you know, killing off regulation or, or anything like that or building nation states on the blockchain or whatever these radical ideas. And to your, to your point initially, yes, there is... Uh, a drive behind this that goes back to the early cypherpunk movement, the, you know, the hardcore crypto anarchist uh, libertarian types. Um, but the tent is much wider right now. And the, the first thing I would say is thank God for those guys because you, know, you, you don't get change without the sort of radical fringe types you know, lobbing the Molotov cocktails into, in, into the castle. Um, you, but it's not necessarily their vision that is the one that comes out of that. And I think we are definitely getting to that, that, that stage right now. I, I'm a, the chairman of the uh, advisory board at, at Coindesk, one of the, you know, I would say, the leading news uh, organization within the blockchain space. And um, you know, they, they're the host of Consensus, uh, you know, I think the most important conference every year. The tent has become incredibly wide. I mean, the number of countries that were represented, the number of, of different... Fortune 500 companies that have got you know, exhibits there. 
Um, it, you know, the conversation around this is so much more diverse now than just what it was when I first got interested in this space. And inherently, that means that their, their vision is going to be much more mainstream than, than that of, of the radicals. And somewhere in the middle of this conversation, something emerges. What I advocate is for everyone to get involved uh, and, and, and elevate this to a conversation that is of public interest. Because then if we don't, we will get this elite group of very wealthy young radicals, some of them brilliant cryptographers, and, and, and often also well-intended, by the way. Right. Um, but nonetheless, embedding into these algorithms um, their values. And what we need is diverse values. We need more women in this space. We need more diversity across the board so that the design of these systems reflects the interests of humanity broadly. Right. And you touched on a point that, uh, that you know, resonated with me. My company, like many people in the room here, are struggling with another trend that exists in the world. Uh, in Europe, they call it the right to be forgotten. Um, in my hometown of Atlanta, there, there was a major company that, that, that was hacked and, and millions of, uh, of people's personal information was stolen. Um, we've seen, you know, a conversation at least about, you know, should Facebook, Amazon, and the, uh, Google, and, and, and the big uh, um, social media firms, I'll call them that as a catchphrase, should they be able to sell our personal information? Should they be able to sell our views? Should they be able to, to, uh, to proffer ideas to us based on what they think we might relate to? And so you've got this trend towards individualization and individual control of information. And then you lay over this other idea of maybe all transactions, all information should be in one big distributed ledger that would be a permanent indelible record with no right to be forgotten. How, how, do you, how do you see that circle being squared? Through technology. Um, I, I, it's, it is. It seems like such a contrast. But in some respects, it's a, there's two, two, two answers. One is it's a mindset change, um, whereby the, the public data uh, once public, suddenly loses its value to a hacker, right? I mean, it's, it's precisely the secretness of um, sort of the way we've constructed identity. I'm not saying, by the way, I'm, right. I'm trying to get to this next part of it, but like, you know, that we should all be putting all of our personal data out there publicly. That would be a very dangerous thing to happen indeed. But when it comes to certain data, it's precisely the ownership of it or the monopolizing of it that makes it valuable and, and, and sensitive, right? Once it's distributed, um, it, it, it ceases to have that value. So you start to think differently about the kind of architecture of our economy when an individual has control of their own data and is able to, to, to participate on their terms rather than the terms of Google and Facebook and everybody else. And I think it's interesting that we're now having this conversation around those big behemoths because that's going to... Um, drive us to, to think about a different architecture. Now, in addition to that, clearly, you know, it's a scary proposition that, you know, we, we could just be placing everywhere our data. Um, and the nice thing is that the same technology that creates the distributed structure of a blockchain, you know, the same field of technology has within it tools to to enhance privacy and allow for interaction even though there's privacy. So zero, zero knowledge proofs is a term that you all should get familiar with. Um, this is a concept in cryptography that allows you to do computation on a set of data and, and know something about it without knowing its underlying components. So in theory, you could run a, a blockchain, know that the state has changed and therefore prove the integrity of everything, but not know where it's come from. And this is of great interest to banks. I know that, that, that Zcash, one of the very most advanced, you know, technologically advanced cryptocurrency um, uh, uh, you know, implementations, um, is working with the financial sector to figure out how in the context of, a, of you know, an interbank um, transactional environment, you protect the information that obviously is very important to banks. So, yeah, it, it's a key question. It also speaks to what do we mean by identity? Solving identity is going to be 
a really important issue. How do we make identity something that we control, something that is a construct around all of the data that matters to, 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 to everybody, but I, I'm able to sort of parcel out attributes of that and not have this kind of fire hose of information about right. who I am being so vulnerable. And so KYC AML has to be rethought. It has to be rethought. Um, uh, and um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a vision that, I, that we kind of touch up on in the book about how this thing might go, go forward. It's complicated, but again, it needs everybody to get involved. But I do think we can square that circle. OK, that's great. Well, um, you don't know this, but I'm uh, one of the longer uh, running participants in this conference. And, and every year, um, I stay in the same room. And every year, I guess, when I leave, uh, my team reserves all the same rooms again. Um, and so would you advise me to get that room again for next year? <laughs> uh, as I said, you know, you're, you're the disruptor here, Jeff. I mean, I you're being you, very kind. Hopefully if you do, you should get a room at Token Fest next year. Uh, that's right. You know? Yeah, we may want to shift out west. <laughs> um, uh, well, two answers. Yeah, you, you're pretty safe. Next year, you'll all still be around. I don't think, again, this is a, a long you know, trajectory here for the reasons that we discussed earlier. Um, but do you, see, um, do you see institutions, like I mentioned, who are intermediaries, who we're intermediaries because we provide governance and oversight and KYC and AML and, and uh, uh, a community um, I mean, information, you know, there, there are societal reasons that, that, that the organizations that I'm talking about have grown up over hundreds of years. Right. Um, is it your mind, that, or do you, do, you, do you think the world just disintermediates and it's purely, everything is peer-to-peer, -peer and we all communicate with each other and we really choose our own societies without any intermediary? I, I really think you're the best person to be asking this question because look, about, look at what's happened to the business of stock exchanges. Yeah. I mean, you, you, know, you, you were literally a physical place for people to trade scripts of paper. What are you now? You're, you're, a, you're a matching engine for right. the same concept. I think there's this service provision that is going to be critical no matter what and the expertise and you know, wisdom and, and stored knowledge that comes with that will be the means by which institutions like these will participate. But in their current form, many of them will need to be inter disintermediated because there will not be a need for them. Like, if we get multi-sig technology properly figured out when it comes to you know, storage of keys and everything else, why do we need custodial banks? Sorry to you know, State Street and, you know, your bank or whoever, but the, the thing is, um, there's a... But where, just let's just tease that one out. Um, where I've got a wallet and a colleague has a wallet and we could each keep our uh, tokens in our personal wallet, so we wouldn't need a third party trusted source, potentially. Um, but what if I lose my phone? Or what if, you know what I mean? But again, technology, I'm not saying that, you know, woo, technology just, it's going to fix it. But there are a lot, of, there is a lot of work being done on all of these sorts of things. So webs of trust uh, is an interesting concept about how when you lose it, you can now call upon 20 people who can vouch for you. And that might not be as simple as just, here are my buddies, but it's something much more sophisticated around, and it could be 20, it could be an institution that loses right. its keys, and there's 20 other institutions that do the same. So that becomes a protective matter. The multi-sig concept, right, which is the, the dual key, I can't, neither one of us can make the transaction happen unless both those keys are on. Right. You know, that, those sorts of things bring layers of protection that, that, that may render a lot of these other functions uh, unnecessary. I think that the bottom line is like, does your institution exist for what is a, I might, might define it as a regulatory purpose uh, in the context of a centralized structure that is moot in a, in a de distributed right. decentralized system. And if so, how are you going to add value in this new world? What can you take from your existence? I'm, I'm in the energy space uh, looking at you know, what public utilities are going to do when we move, when we start thinking of our grid as an interlinked uh, system of distributed grid, microgrids, which will be more secure, which will have more pricing dynamic at that local level. What does the utility do? I think they provide phenomenally important 
uh, data analysis. They, 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 they bring load managing expert expertise. Yes, people will lose their jobs. There's no doubt about that, but that's not different from any technological change. Hopefully, they will get redeployed into different things. I do think that this is, you know, in terms of this end of work concept that is relevant, obviously, not just in this sector, but so much of technology, this technology is very much a player in that. We have a section there about what hap might happen to the accounting profession when we have real time <laughs> right. you know, data. Um, and therefore, what might happen to equity analysts who, you know, every three months rely on that data to, right. to benchmark their results? Um, Be careful, a, those guys are already under a lot of pressure. Here, right. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but they will find things to do if they're smart. I mean, because yeah. the design thinking, the mindset, look, Gary, Gary is in a way reinventing himself in this way with us, right? right. He's bringing all of that wisdom, that knowledge, that understanding and applying it. Um, we're going to move even more so into a knowledge economy than we even are now. And, and, and that's where it goes. So massive disintermediation is going to happen, I think, as we get 10, 20 years out. Right. Um, it's, but right now is the time to think about how do we reinvent both the human beings and the institutions to play not just a, a role that is designated by a regulator, but actually is relevant to the new you know, self-governing or different governance, I'll say, because it's not just self, but you know, differently governed structure that a distributed ledger environment provides. Okay. Please uh, help me in thanking him for uh, giving us his thoughts this morning. Thank you. That's our conversation for this week. Our guest was Michael Casey, author of The Truth Machine, The Blockchain and the Future of Everything. He was in conversation with Jeffrey Sprecher, the founder, chairman, and CEO of Intercontinental Exchange. If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. And if you've got a comment or question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show, email us at icehouse at theice.com or tweet at us at NYSE. Our show is produced by Pete Ash and Ian Wolf with production assistance from Ken Abel and Stephen Porter. I'm Josh King, your host, signing off from FIA Boca in Boca Raton, Florida. Thanks for listening. Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties express or implied as to the accuracy or completeness of this information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell or a solicitation of an offer to buy any security or recommendation of any security or trading practice.